nowadays you can buy really nice systems to homebrew in. But back then mm-hmm. it was not so much. I mean, you know, it was hard to to put it all together, and and you had to read books. And I go back and read Charlie Papazian's book, uh, the uh, the what's it called, the uh, the new home brewer. Or so, so I don't know. That's probably not right, but uh, the joy <laughs> of home brewing. I think that's the name of it. And that you read that book and it's nostalgic. It's so dated at this point. Uh, but uh, that's how I got started. That's how everybody got started because there wasn't yeah. really other way to go. You know, it's, it's it's really exploded. Like the craft beer scene, the homebrew scene has exploded. New inventions all the time. New gadgets. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, new new uh, equipment manufacturers. Uh, you know, you can buy pretty much any. The same thing's true in the craft brewing business, by the way. So, back in the day, the craft brewers started. They had to convert old dairy equipment. So that's that was the only thing. I've that heard that. Died. You know, well now, I mean, there are so many guys out there, companies out there, manufacturing two barrel, one barrel, two barrel, three barrel, five barrel, ten barrel, fifteen, whatever barrel size you want systems. You know, they're, they're just, it's just, it's common now, you know, and it wasn't back in the day. So the, 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 the craft brewing movement has, has really caused the manufacturing to, to re, uh, be resurgent in the U.S., you know, this type of manufacturing. Most of the time, uh, the American companies are making their own stuff. Uh, some of the companies that provide uh, craft brewing equipment are importing their tanks and whatever from manufacturers in China. But we bought our brewing equipment from Portland Kettle Works in Oregon, Portland, Oregon. Wow. And they they manufacture the tanks themselves. So we went out to the factory there uh, before we bought the equipment. Well, no, this was after we bought the equipment, but I discovered this after we went out and visited there. So I assumed that they were, you know, doing some of the assembly of the tanks or whatever. I didn't know. But we their loading dock has sheets of steel, steel piping, you know, stainless, of course. Uh, and then they have all the machinery in their warehouse or manufacturing facility, I think is probably a better way to put it, where they shape the the the, the steel into round shapes, weld it together. They they literally manufacture the tank. The only part that they don't make are the the domes. Uh, the domes have to be stamped out, uh, and they're you know there there's lots you know depending on what size tank it determines what size dome you need. So having all the different size things available to make the domes for the tanks, they felt like wasn't they didn't have the footprint or the the ability to do that. So that's the only part of it they don't. But the domes of the tank still have to be put onto the tank. So they're, you know, after they roll the steel out, weld it together, you need to put whatever fittings need to be on it, then they put the domes on the tank and weld them on. I mean, it was just not having ever had any experience with uh, with manufacturing. Like I, I was in medicine my whole life. I had no idea how stuff was made, you know, I, I couldn't have told you anything about it, but uh, seeing it uh, firsthand and seeing American kids doing the welding and, and just watching them make stuff, uh, you know, really, really is impressive, you know, and it, it's something to be prideful of, no doubt, so American made, that's what we were shooting for, and that's pretty much what we got, so. That's awesome, yeah, I, I had heard that a lot of the craft brewers were really using old dairy equipment because like you said that's the only thing that could you know fit what they were trying to make size wise and so yeah i also love that the the world of the manufacturing area is getting so much bigger and the technology is catching up to what people were you know were kind of macgyvering together to do anyway but now they can do it with just one uh piece of equipment so um i love the innovation and the technology is catching up to where we are now well, that's what we decided we wanted to do, you know, is I'm not a – well, I, I, I take that back. I've changed a little bit. I, I used to not be very mechanically oriented, you know, like if uh, 
something were to, uh, you know, like take your car, for example, something goes wrong on the car. It's like, I'm not really fixing it, you know. Well, mm-hmm. um, one of the other things I did after I retired is I went to welding school. So I did an eight-month course in welding and uh, uh, literally came away uh, with uh, three certifications from that. And uh, I, since then, I've learned on my own how to do uh, sanitary welding. Sanitary welding is different than other welding. It's usually all stainless steel. And you have to uh, use certain techniques to prevent oxidation of the metal from occurring. And uh, so it's not – and to have a course in sanitary welding would be ridiculously expensive just because of the cost of materials, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not really offered any – you can't go to the school for sanitary welding or whatever, for example. It doesn't exist. I mean, it would be – the tuition would be $100,000 just so you had material to weld, you know. Uh, but no, you, you can learn it from other people that know how to do it, and there's some YouTube videos and whatever. So I spent a lot of time learning how to do it. Of course, it's very useful for me because all the welding you do in a brewery has to be sanitary welding. So True. So anyway, I've, I've learned uh, – I think this is where my uh, – newfound appreciation of manufacturing has come from is after I went to the welding school and saw what, what, you know, the other people do or what some other people do for a living and seeing how they do it and how they go about it. It's given me that appreciation for it. I think that's where it came from. So, you know, I'm not afraid to tackle even small jobs now. Like if the coffee machine (laughs) doesn't work in the morning, I'll take that sucker apart and figure out what's wrong with it and do my best to fix it. So, you know, uh, ten years ago, it'd be like, no way, man! Send it back, send it back to the manufacturer. I'm not going to fix that. Not now. I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll tackle it myself. <laughs> so, when you started learning, you know, the, the home brewing craft, and how long were you brewing, and then before you retired? Because you know, you said after you retired, you know, you did everything you wanted to do, and you you then opened the brewery. But how long were you brewing before that uh, idea even it came up? Oh, 30 years. Yeah, I started brewing immediately. It became legal. So that was like uh, 1988 or 89, something like that. And wow. uh, I home brewed, you know, like that intermittently through that time period, more so at first and less so later. Uh, and then uh, in uh, when we got the idea that we wanted to open this brewery, it, well, what happened, I think, that really – solidified the idea of the brewery was we found the ideal piece of property. So mm-hmm. my wife and I and my brother, we were looking, and his, his wife, we were looking around for properties and we couldn't find anything that was, you know, it was either too, a little bit too far from where we lived. And you're like, do you really want to drive 45 minutes to go to a, a place where you work and then drive 45 minutes? How are you going to, you know, you might, come and go from there two or three times a day are you really going to do that if it's that far away you know and we're like all right so we kind of got discouraged when we couldn't find an ideal piece of property to do this you know an old building you know there's lots of old buildings in in towns around pittsburgh and they're all available (laughs) you know (laughs) buy a building for fifty thousand, and it's going to take a million to get the building to where you can actually safely go in it you know so we got we after we looked around a number of those buildings we were really pretty discouraged because it just seemed like there's no way you can afford to do this right you just can't afford to do it and uh then uh we were driving home uh not far from our house there was this little piece of property that had a house an old you know pretty decrepit house and a little shack on it that used to be an ice cream stand back in the day and it was suddenly for sale, and we inquired about it, and we, you know, the deal worked out. We got it, uh, and that was the really the moment that it became reality was when that piece of property became available. The, you know, we, it's convenient. It's ten minutes for my brother or me to get there, so. You know, uh, it just be, it just it just turned out it's like yeah, this is it, and that's the moment I think the idea was actually born. So, 
It's Very important. nice. You got to have. It you, if you, you will, you'll realize how important it is. Some of the other uh, brewery, there's another brewery in Ambridge, actually. I, I you know, I, I honestly hate to rag on Ambridge. You know, I, I and I hope it <laughs> comes across that way. Somebody listens to this, they're going to hear that. Ambridge is there's lots of charm in Ambridge, and there's two breweries in Ambridge that are that are that are like my brothers or whatever. One's Fermata, and the other one's called Alter Genius. But the owners of both of those have to drive like one one guy drives over 45 minutes to get there, and uh, you know that's just too far. I think you know it's just too it's you you got to be able to get to your place of business or it becomes an impediment for you to go there. And if it's your business, I mean, you got you know you know what this is, right? You got to be mm-hmm. there. It's your business. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't let someone else run it or whatever. I mean, if it's going to have your mark on it, your it's going to have your imprint of who you are in it. You got to be there to do it. And so that mm-hmm. we felt like that was important. And when we found this piece of property, it became reality. No, I mean, that makes sense. And, and uh, I like that you say that because you do have to, you know, like you said, you have to be there. You have to make sure you're also helping shape the culture and the vibe and everything that's going on in that brewery because if you're not, or business in general. So if you're not there, people don't know or you don't know what is going on there. And then you hear stories about stuff and you're like, wait, how is that happening? But you don't know because you're not there. That's right. It, it, the vibe is the right word. You and culture; those are two of the perfect mm-hmm. words. Vibe and culture. You said it. You, your owner, the owner of the business, should be setting the vibe and the culture. You know, I'm not sure anybody would have said that about me 30 years ago. I'm not sure I should have been saying <laughs> vibe 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, 30 years ago, vibe meant something completely different. So you know, the, the way the the way the language. Changes and morphs that you know you got you got to go with it. I used my welding skills to create the atmosphere there. I made a uh, so I had this idea. You know, we were like, okay, well, are we going to just buy tables and chairs, or are we going to try to do you know come up with something unique? So, you know, while while the building phase was going on, we were all brainstorming and doing stuff. So, a friend of mine at the welding academy had uh, a, a box truck, and he's like. Uh, I could borrow that truck. So we called up a uh, pen barrel company. You know, they literally deal in barrels, you know, not, not barrels like barrels of beer barrels, but like normal barrels, the 55 gallon drum kind. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole bunch of different kinds of 55 gallon barrel drums for different purposes. You know, it's, it's a whole nother world, right? Again, something I knew nothing about. So one, one, Steel barrels like another, right? Wrong. They're all different. It depends on the coating. It depends on what material they're made. It depends on how you seal it. it. Depends on what it's rated for. I, it's amazing, right? But anyways, they recycle barrels at Penn Barrel Company, and you go down there and they have this long tube uh, up above ground that the barrel goes through, where where the recycled barrels literally get burnt. The inside of them gets burnt out. And then uh, if they're really feeling uh, sophisticated about it, they'll sandblast them afterwards. But uh, anyhow, I brought I I went down there with the big truck that my friend had, and I bought a bunch of barrels, like twenty some barrels, Jeez. and uh, brought them back home. And they were sitting in my basement. And I have a pla- Of course, now that I went to welding school, I of course have a, a welder, a multifunction welder. I have a plasma cutter. I've got uh, vapor extraction, you know, I mean, I've done all kinds of stuff that uh, to make a little welding shop down in my basement, you know, uh, air compressor. And uh, anyhow, so I uh, started working with these barrels that I had, all these barrels, and uh, came up with a design to make a, a chair out of them. And then I thought, well, it can't just be a barrel, you know, you can't. So I, I learned about heat treating and whatnot while I was in welding school. So I uh, decided to take some of these barrels and, and see if you can heat treat it and get special effects by heat treating the steel. And you can. And so I wound up making all these cool barrel chairs that have this blue, I call it industrial camo, you know, but it's, 
it, maybe there is an <laughs> camo, but it looks it looks 